Genau, die, die noch nicht sitzen, die bitte ich bitte Platz zu nehmen. Ladies and gentlemen, please kindly take your seats and I would like to welcome you all most warmly here from Berlin, dear alumni, dear guests from Berlin, from the Prodiga Forum in Berlin, just around the corner from the Foreign Office. Welcome to the alumni event of the German Academic Exchange Service and the motto is Shaping Europe and Strengthening Europe's Ideas for Europe. This is what we want to discuss tonight. We want to see how these ideas and thoughts could be introduced and uh, could be fed into the German presidency, EU presidency, and we would like to discuss with you tonight here face to face in Berlin and you at home by live stream. We're very happy that you're here with us, that you follow us on the internet and you shouldn't only follow us, you should also participate in the event and I will talk about that in a minute. Now I would like to welcome the people from Berlin, 50 to 60 people can be here. Please observe the hygiene rules, keep your distance. Distance. Um, the chairs have been arranged accordingly. If you move around, you must wear a mask, but you can take off your mask when you're seated because we have sufficient distance between the chairs. Downstairs, um, we uh, debated whether we should use the EU Council Presidency mask or the Black DAD mask. Well, everyone can do whatever he or she prefers. We want you you to participate um, on social media and you can do it as follows. The hashtag for tonight is DAAD alumni for EU. You see it on the charts behind us. So um, it's the heading of the charts. Um, I hope we um, manage the Twitter trends. Um, now here we have uh, at DAAD um, hyphen EU. If you want to um, Twitter as well, you can also participate at, in Facebook and Instagram under at the AID hyphen Germany or uh, the alumni um, address. And um, you can also give us a live feedback in the Mentimeter. You might know the system. Uh, if you don't, I explain to you in a second. You can use the QR code you see on the screen. Scan it with your mobile phone, you automatically get to the right page. Or you simply serve on www.menti.com and use the seven digit code 6684762. Then you have access to the page. And please don't leave after the first question because then you will be blocked. We want to hear your feedback all evening. So once once you've entered the app, please stay. Okay, that was a lot of explanations, and now I would like to ask the first question, and that's a simple one, this one. What country are you from? So you see a lot of countries, Germany um, is the majority of participants, we have a lot of Germans, but we have the Netherlands, we have Greece, we have Ireland, we have Italy and Spain. Are there only Germans in this room here or are there people from other countries or with other nationalities as well? If so, please yell and tell us where you're from. Italy. We have Italy represented here. Hello, hello is not a country. <laughs> so there are many different nationalities represented here. We're very happy about that. And this leads us to the second question. Tonight we want to talk about the challenges the EU is facing at the moment, but also about problems. Uh, but most of you are enthusiastic about the EU. And that is what this question is about. What fascinates you about the EU? What is most fascinating for you? You can also give several answers. Is it travel without limits? Is it working? Is it solidarity? Or is it the economic success we can achieve together? I'm really interested in knowing what the answers are. Well, we see 
the winner that is traveling, working, and studying without borders. This seems to be the most important advantage of our alumni or for our alumni that follow us on the web and also here in this room. And the second most important point is to work together on on the challenges of the future. This is what we will talk about tonight. Nothing is more important than an idea um, whose time has come. This is a quote from Victor Hugo. But having an idea once is not sufficient. We can be happy that we live in a Europe where the idea prevailed that it's better to live together peacefully than to confronting each other in armed conflict. But we have to preserve what we achieve. And you as DAD alumni have an important role to play here because uh, hardly any other group is traveling so much, speaks so many languages, knows so many cultures. And for this uh, event, the DAD uh, called for ideas and video messages from the member states in Europe. There was a very great echo and a lot of feedback, and the result is what you see now. My name is Tiana Gandera. I come from Estonia and I believe that a common European refund system for plastic and glass containers helps to move towards a more sustainable Europe. I dream about Europe with clean air transport. Ich finde, dass die Mobilität in Europa sehr wichtig ist. Lass uns daran weiterarbeiten. My idea for Europe is to ban the use of cages in animal agriculture in the European Union. It's time we end the cage age. Media for Europe is promoting the study of classics in the member states to create awareness of our shared cultural past. Unsere Idee ist ein EU-Förderungspaket für junge Lehrkräfte und Akademiker. Das Interesse für Menschen und Kultur unserer europäischen Nachbarländer wecke ich bei meinen Schülern durch gemeinsame Musiktheaterprojekte. Kulturtraining Plus. Das ist ein Online-Kurs zur Vorbereitung zum Erasmus-Austausch. From the European Quarter in Brussels to a small town in the center of Spain, the European Union is present. Investing in educational research is a commitment for the future of the world and in particular to a strong European Union. As digital skills will become more and more important, I suggest a European digital learning platform for kids and adults, so we can together become creators and not only consumers of digital content, spend family time together and connect with people from all over Europe. My idea is that the digitalization of our cultural heritage provides original and unique knowledge which has to be preserved for the generations to come. Lasst nicht ganz Europa sehen und das kostenlos. Wie wäre es also mit einem kostenlosen öffentlichen Personenverkehr? Adopt the grandparent, adopt the grandchild. This is my proposal to help building elective affinities all across Europe. An idea for Europe, full transparency in decision making and brave moves towards debt neutralization. Not only would this guarantee a real European Union, it would also safeguard the prospects of its future. Better cooperation of European universities will strengthen the European identity within the younger generation. Meine Idee für Europa ist ein gemeinsamer Datenschutz, denn gemeinsam erreichen wir mehr als alleine. Meine Idee für Europa ist eine interaktive Karte für Raumentwicklung. We could make Europe strong again by giving an opportunity to every student to visit European institutions and to get closer to the European Union. My idea for Europe to form European regions would encourage greater political activity among citizens and reduce nationalist friction. My idea for Europa is social media and social to make. My statement is Europe without borders or leapfrog over European borders. Menschenrechte for economic relations. This is a privilege that we must preserve through constant prevention work in Europe.
Ja, Sie dürfen gern kurz klatschen. Ich glaube, da war viel dabei. Well, you can applaud if you like. Uh, there was a lot of content in that video. Wir haben viele Ideen gehört. Ideen, We heard mit dem a lot of nice ideas, plastic, uh, more detailed plastic ones, system, for example, a plastic bottle recycling system, theater projects that were proposed, but we also heard about a greater concepts such as human rights, financial concepts that um, really create the stable bridges within the EU. And maybe some of these ideas will be reflected during the European European, um, the German uh, Council presidency. Making Europe strong again together is the motto of the presidency. Uh, but you are also involved here, and we ask you, what do you expect from the German EU Council presidency? There are lots of demands and lots of expectations already, but we're collecting ideas, and after the two keynotes you will hear now, we will get the uh, overall view of the social media team's results, and we will discuss them briefly with the speakers. You can ask questions any time, and without much further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Dr. Andreas Gergen, the head of the Department for Culture and Communication at the German Foreign Office. And welcome to you, Mr. Gergen. Thank you very much, Ms. Ruland. Ladies and gentlemen, it is somewhat unusual to talk in a room that is only half full at first sight, but is actually full with people. And that is what Europe is like. It's not a physical space. It is a space that we have to invent, design, and politically shape. And at the same time, and for this, COVID was a good lesson we learned, a space we have to design which was called fraternity during the French Revolution. And what we used to translate with solidarity is much more than that. It is a being sensitive for each other and for each other's societies. So when I talk about the EU Council Presidency in a minute. Please bear with me if I disappoint you and don't tell you what the status of the negotiations about the medium-term financing framework are, that I will not present the EU program for the German EU Presidency, and that I will not lecture you on why we need a sovereign Europe. And why we want to make Europe strong again. First and foremost, I would like to say thank you to you that as alumni of the DAAD, um, that you came from other countries to Germany. Germany is not in the center. And that you um, then deal with Germany and advocate for yourself, for what your personal career passes, but that you also are open to the challenges of this system, education system, science system, and this society. Rest assured, I also had a scholarship from DAAD, and my country told me I would have to become an ambassador of my country after my scholarship. The country was true. I got to know the country. I got to know the language. But I'm not a, an ambassador of my host country, and nobody expects you to be an ambassador of Germany just because you had a, ba a scholarship from Germany. Expectations are completely different. You should make the best of what you do here for yourselves. And by making the best of it for yourselves within a university system and a society, you contribute to changing this society. Education. Um, basic education that you've um, passed by a long time ago is not satisfaction to optimize yourselves. 
fundamental education is training about society and what you need in order to move within a complex society. You left that behind a long time ago, and now as alumni, as former scholarship holders, you are in a situation where you bear responsibility yourselves regarding the development of society in, in Europe. And of course, this includes a sentence from the presidency program. It's about sovereignty and it's about solidarity. We are not threatened as Europe. You read everywhere, we need resilience. We have to protect our values. Sorry, we are the continent that exploited other continents for centuries. We shouldn't be afraid now. We should then discuss about social models and prove that our understanding of a free society and a republic can compete with social models who say, it's enough to have economic freedom. Why do I need democracy on top of it? I can simply have a one-party system. Wealth is secured, and all these cumbersome public discussions we can spare them and be successful as well. Or another model where people say democracy is nice and well, but it's better to have a system where you have uh, presidents who have a term of 30 years. That guarantees more stability than these instable instruments like democracy. But if we say academic education is the basis for the further development of a society, we need the freedom of science, a space of freedom that's protected from politics but that society feels responsible for because it finances and supports this space of freedom. That's a wonderful construction. In our construction of society, with the freedom of art and science, we anchored the contradiction in terms of society. The freedom of art and science is not subjected to the limitations that political rights are subjected to in the political space. They are even more protected. These are the spaces where you are not talking about a potential improvement of the real world, but about the real possibility of another, a different world, so you can think against society within society, in basic research, in social science, in all other areas, where you have the unlimited freedom to think what a better world could look like. And then you have this huge task to invest all your knowledge and find your way in this society and see what of your knowledge can be applied there, not applied like regular application of knowledge, but applying it as a human being to help society to become a better society. And we owe it to the people in the world. And this is a responsibility we have been bearing since the Age of Enlightenment. We owe it to the people in the world to show that a democracy and a republic is based on contradictions and difficulties. It's a model that works, a model that creates wealth, a model that makes it possible that you bring out the best in yourselves and that doesn't live off exploitation of people or continents or raw materials, but that makes a better living and living together possible in the world without scientists, without research, without people who receive the best education that our country can make available, we will not be able to do that. And please don't underestimate the universities. Don't underestimate the immense knowledge you can gain there, the possibilities to get involved and participate and enjoy this time. Use it for yourselves because you count among the best, not only of our society, but of your respective societies as well. And you made the best of it. You ventured into new territory, into a time of openness, and you want to come to terms with yourselves 
and with the system, and I should like to thank you very much for that. If I may, I would like to touch upon a second point and take you to the inner circle or the kitchen of administration and education policies. With the DAAD and other institutions, we are working on a new definition of what science diplomacy could be. And there are three aspects we focus on mainly, and I would like to explain them to you as European aspects. The first is we can no longer assume and take for granted that our understanding of scientific freedom is a generally accepted understanding or is a model for other regions of the world. But it also means that when we talk about solidarity and fraternity, that we bear a joint responsibility to support structures of freedom also in other countries. We can do that through the excellent work of the DAAD to build up technical centers, but it can also happen through helping other institutions abroad with funding, with um, their normative framework to pro protect them, to help them find spaces of freedom in their own societies. And it should also mean that you yourselves in what you do also advocate for and support the freedom of research and science. In the past, we didn't have that. We all assumed that the value system um, might not be applicable in other countries, but is superior to that of other countries. Today, we did away with that, and um, now we can talk about a reform of foreign policies. The second aspect is horizontal relationships. In the future, science policies are not possible without including knowledge in societies in our political decision making. You know it as citizen science in science, in politics. You recently saw that a former minister of finance uh, advocated for citizens' councils. To give you an example, you live in Germany in uh, times where people, um, that is citizens, decide about imprisonment. Um, and we should be living in a society where the knowledge of our citizens is also included into decisions prepared by the administration and, yes, also in what science does or the scientific institutions do, permanent self-perfection in of a semi-open or self-referential system does not necessarily lead to a situation where a system gives the best answers to its own questions. And the third point is content. And we should dare to say that there are two important issues for the next decade. One is diversity. Democracy lives off contradictions. We need an aesthetics where difference means beauty, and we don't need aesthetics where homogeneity is confused with beauty. And thirdly, we need a system where diversity and difference among citizens and people living in our countries is considered a prerequisite for success and not something alien. That is the first issue. And the second issue, you might call that the planetary challenge as the president of the uh, DAAD. I'd like to welcome him most warmly. You can call that planetary uh, challenges, Anthropocene, sustainability, climate change, whatever you call it. It's about a different understanding and overcoming the Cartesian uh, separation between nature and culture. We're part of what we experience, and we will not return to a world of the year 2019 where we take the plane on Mondays like other people take a bus, fly 5,000 kilometers to participate in a conference and return the same day and think we did something meaningful. We will have to consider these costs not only in monetary terms. We have to consider them in our behavior and in our 
ideas. And I'm very grateful that the scientific organizations led by the DAAD um, accompanied us in this thought saying we are willing to focus on tasks that are relevant for diversity and sustainability. And they show this European solidarity because they want to focus more on the neighboring continents, particularly Africa. We will not have a future in Europe if we're not aware of our responsibility there and if we don't accept our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis Africa. That is the look into the kitchen. And I'm most willing to answer all your questions regarding the medium-term financial framework, the common foreign and defense and security policy, institutional topics. Um, we can easily um, discuss for an entire evening. But now I would like to thank you again that as alumni and scholarship holders of the DAAD, you confront yourselves with this country. And thank you that you don't only make the best of it for yourselves, but for those who live, learn, and work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Gergen. Thank you very much for this whole plethora of different topics that you covered in the course of your presentation. You spoke about democracy, controversy, freedom, and science. And the second keynote speech will be delivered to us by Dr. Dorothea Ruland, the Secretary General of the DAAD, our host, so to speak. I would like to welcome her instead, and she's going to talk about the contribution of science to a strong Europe and education. Thank you very much, Mr. Gergen. Thank you very much. You covered a lot of topics in the course of the presentation. I would like to welcome all of you, including the reps of the German Parliament, Mr. Staffler, members of the European Parliament. Some of you are logged on. Mr. Bloch is here. Mr. Morishan is hopefully connected via the internet from Brussels. Mich is Professor Blechigen and Talkon from the Free University of Berlin. We will talk to you later. But dear alumni, and it's incredibly beautiful to speak in front of people. We haven't had that for a while. Of course, we learned that digitization and the daily video conferences also open up completely new spaces. That is completely true as well. But I don't want to preempt anything of what you're going to say, Professor Blechian, but the universities are going to look different after Corona than before Corona. And the scientific landscape will also be completely different. I think we'll get to speak about this in the course of tonight's event. But the core topic today is Europe and the European Union. How can we shape it and strengthen it? So we also talk about our own future. And let me preempt shortly what Mr. Gergen had already alluded to. We can only be strong if we act together. And the EU presidency, the German EU presidency, gives us the possibility to think about it and put Europe into the limelight of public attention. We gladly do so and we think that this is one of our core tasks. And I would like to add to that from our daily work at the DAAD. We all have our strong sides. To us, the world in the DAAD has become much smaller. Every four weeks, we get connected to our European partners. Every four weeks, we establish contact with our international partners. In the past, we would have hopped on a plane to fly to New York, but now we have a video conference. All of a sudden, you know what these guys look like with long beards, T-shirts on, and shorts on, and they know what we look like during our leisure time as well. So a lot of new things have developed, and after that, we will come up with a new blend of the good, uh, old and the good new things. Europe, making people enthusiastic about Europe. There are ample opportunities to do so. More than 10 million young people over the last 33 years participated in the Erasmus Plus program. Every year, the DA grants 6,000 individual scholarships to students in Europe. It promotes many cross-border partnerships in many of the networks in Europe. 
cross-border traveling and working, studying, which was mentioned before, doing research, for many he has become nothing of the extraordinary any longer. And for many of us, and this is also what Dr. Gergen said in the course of his presentation, has become a guarantor for peace, security, and prosperity. But at the same time, the European Union and the world is faced with many different challenges. The former foreign minister phrased it in an appropriate manner because he said the world got out of control and we jointly have to live up to these challenges. For that purpose, we need a discourse between national and European policymakers and with the citizens of Europe in general. This has become more important than ever before, and this is really of the essence. Because last but not least, we are also talking about Europe's position within the world. Tonight, together with you, our alumni, and our guest from Berlin and Brussels, we would like to discuss how we can secure the long-term achievements of the EU on a long-term basis and tackle challenges that we're facing in the European Union jointly at the same time. Of course, it will not be possible for us to solve all the problems tonight. They would be our ambitious, but we can briefly touch upon them. And I'm so happy to see that so many alumni got logged in. I think we've got approximately 1,000 participants throughout the whole of Europe. And this is an expression of their strong interest. They are very much interested in getting involved in a discourse on the European Union and Europe. That seems to be very important to many. And I'm also very much impressed. And I was very proud of the many new ideas that were presented to us in the video. Thanks very much to all the participants once again. Now, let me move on to the core topic of my presentation tonight, and that is the contribution of education and science to a strong Europe. Similar to Mr. Gargan, I would like to summarize my presentation in four different topics. My first idea is, never ever has internationally networked education and science been as important as it is today. Let's start off by zooming on the current situation. The COVID-19 crisis has made us face tremendously new challenges. Who would have thought that it's possible a year ago that the DAAD produces a giveaway, which is a face mask, and that many who are sitting in this room wear face masks? This would have been completely inconceivable, even in the worst of all science fiction movies. But the pandemic has made one thing particularly clear. We really depend on science and research. What is the most important thing that most people are currently waiting for is an effective vaccine or medication. The advice of scientists during the crisis is as important as it has never been before. And this brings me back to what Dr. Gergen has just said. There is a broad consensus in our society, but also in many other societies, which stipulate that the reputation of scholars and the trust of the citizens in scholars has increased during the crisis. I think this became quite apparent. I think it is now at 80%. A couple of months ago, it was much lower. What impresses me most is that scholars and sciences are not looking for easy solutions. And this is something that the society accepts by and large. And to me, this goes to show that our democracy is really strong. Without scholars, it will not be possible to get this crisis under control. Scientists, on their behalf, need very well-established European and international networks for close cooperation and collaboration. Many of you might know about this making of COVID-19, then you can see where the big clusters have emerged across national borders for closer cooperation. These make it possible to pool resources and exchange expertise. No university, no country, no scholar alone can solve these big global problems alone. This can only happen at the global level. And we can be happy in Europe about the fact that we have developed these networks. And in the past, we used to travel. But I can only confirm that people are jealous of what we have achieved in this regard. This leads me on to my second point. Social and societal changes can only be solved together, and for that we need a strong exchange in order to establish these networks and extend them. Only with the help of international cooperation can the big societal challenges of our time and age be dealt with. 
Apart from fighting the pandemic, this also includes other topics that were already mentioned by Mr. Gergen. Climate change, sustainability, utilization in a reasonable manner, digital technology and artificial intelligence, amongst others. And many of the topics were discussed in our midst also with the support of the Foreign Office. Let's go back to the topic of Europe. Only if we pull our resources and joint shoulders can these global challenges be met by our research and education centers in Germany and Europe and remain competitive. We need to continue to strengthen our European education and European research space. This brings us back to budgetary affairs. We expect of the German EU presidency that it is going to fight for this as much as it can in the next couple of months to come. The future EU budget, which is going to be adopted in a couple of months, education and research have to be considered as being so important that more financial resources will be allocated to them. But in the current draft, unfortunately, this is not the case. Mrs. Schafflan is giving me a nod. We are very happy about the fact that our members of parliament from Brussels, Mr. Mureshan and Mr. Bloss, are fighting for these topics within the European Parliament. And you, Mr. Staffler, you signed a letter that was written by many members of parliament across party lines in order to promote the increase of financial resource to be allocated to Erasmus+. Plus. Thanks very much for that. On to the third point. We need to strengthen the role of universities in and for our societies. The universities in Europe make a very important contribution to the development of democratic societies. They are quite important stakeholders in this regard. At the universities, we lay the foundation for many things in our society, critical thinking, the quest for truth and new ideas, and fact-based discussions amongst students. These values are being conveyed to students. Universities are places of tolerance, openness, and diversity, as Mr. Gargan already mentioned. Universities continuously need to work against the idea that people consider them to be ivory towers being separated from their environment, but they are deeply anchored in our society. In Germany, this is very often called the third mission, which is kind of a misleading term, but that's what we mean by that. The process towards European Nationalization and internationalization that is being developed at universities must be carried into societies. And we have dealt with that intensively. We commissioned a lot of studies on this topic, such as one study which is called Internationalization for Society, where we use a couple of examples in order to show how this can be achieved successfully. For example, Erasmus students from one country were sent to schools in another country, and therefore they familiarized themselves from scratch with the value of looking at things from a different angle. In some European countries, universities are particularly strong. This is where you find the European universities. They go back to an idea that was developed by President Macron, presented to the people in a speech delivered at the University of Lisbon. This idea was taken up rather quickly from the European Union. And two bits for tender have already been organized. And 35 German universities, including the Free University of Berlin, by the way, Professor Brechner Talcott, join forces with partners from other European countries in order to teach, learn, and do research together. This morning, I had a discussion with a university principal from Israel, and I discussed this particular topic. And in many parts of the world, this has become a completely new approach, a new way of thinking, a new mindset. And many partners outside of Europe really observe very closely how networks are being established between universities. For Ilo Stakla said, well, universities compete with each other, don't they? We do not cooperate, but rather compete with each other. And I tried very hard, and maybe you've got to do the same when you pay a visit to him again, Mrs. Saiko. We are one step ahead because we cooperate and collaborate with each other rather closely. In these projects, we use multilingualism, innovation, innovative 
formats for teaching and learning, digital exchange, which is particularly significant, but also cooperation with society is something that we work on day in, day out. It is nothing less than the establishment and creation of a European identity. The DAD supports this EU initiative as much as possible and makes German participants additional financial resources available from the funds of the Federal Ministry of Education and Research. This initiative strengthens our system of universities and makes it internationally competitive because competition does exist. There is tension between cooperation on the one hand and competition on the other. In order to be successful, and this brings me on to my fourth idea, and this is very much in line with what Dr. Göring has already said, is that European values and European freedom needs to be strengthened. That's not an easy topic, but a very important one at the universities. The freedom of science and the autonomy of universities, such as the freedom of the expression and the freedom of the press are integral part and parcel of the European set of values. In view of some developments in some EU member states, let me just talk about the central European universities. It is more important than ever before to defend these values also within Europe. This does not only apply to the realm of politics. Universities themselves can also make a strong contribution by passing on these values and providing the space for a critical discussion and reflection upon them. Now, let me conclude by saying what we expect of the EU German presidency. During the presidency, we expect of the German government that it will set the tracks in order to strengthen science and education within the EU by constantly further developing the European space for education and research. I already made mention of the financial implications that this has, but we also need inter more intercultural European exchange programs for young people to be passed on at an early stage. We expect that scientific questions, the autonomy of universities will be defended within and without, outside of the European Union. And last but not least, even though I did not mention this topic beforehand at all, within the DAD we wish for a very strong inner European cohesion. And these networks of universities can be an integral part and parcel of that. At the same time, we want to develop Europe which is ready and willing for global international cooperation. International cooperation does not stop at European borders. That holds particularly true for the realm of science. And last but not least, I also think about the cooperation with our former EU partner, Great Britain. The exchange of students with Britain and cooperation among scholars is very important, and this is why we still need close collaboration with Britain, which is, of course, significance. I do not only want to call upon the German government during the EU presidency, but also upon the British government to do more in this regard. It is a wish that we share together with the scientific community in Britain. It will be interesting to see what you expect from the German EU presidency, dear alumni, and I wish all of you and us a very exciting evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ruland. Please have a seat. Mr. Gergen, please also take your seat here on the panel and take a microphone. We already heard about your expectations, Ms. Ruland, and um, I think some of your thoughts are worth discussing. But at the beginning of this round, we asked the alumni and alumni to um, formulate their questions. And I would like to hand over to Heidi Wedel, who is responsible for the media team. And she collected some contributions. Yes, we uh, collected some voices of alumni from different European countries. Before I present them, um, I would like to uh, mention the Mentimeter code again. The code is 6684762. Okay, now we hear our alumni's expectations from the European, from the German EU presidency. 
Johanna says, I want more European decision making um, uh, potential um, to resolve problems uh, on the European level. Dita wrote that I want to strengthen I expect a strengthening of the feeling of belonging together. We have a question from Carmen Arcos saying, does the German Council Presidency is also working on the Conference on the Future of Europe? Is it open for a true reform in the sense of strengthening European integration? And is it working on that? Another question directly for Mr. Gergen. What can the EU do for people in Poland specifically, for people who want the constitutional state and the freedom of science being observed in their country? Another question to you, Mr. Gergen, is you talked about the German science uh, policy or foreign policy focusing on science. Are you also advocating for a European science policy? If I may interrupt you, um, these are very big questions already. Mr. Gergen, you had two questions about constitutionality and the situation in Poland. How does the EU presidency focus on that? Well, many of you read the newspapers in recent days and you heard about discussions about the principle of the constitutional state and how that is enforced. Now I uh, take the role of a, the typical role of an EU presidency. You don't have your own interest. You pursue the interest of all and have to find a common solution. And this is how I evade an answer. You will not get a statement from me about any European member state. It's the role of the role of the presidency to see what's being discussed between the Council and Parliament, and you see how. Um, the connections between the constitutional state and the uh, MFR are um, connected. Um, it's not a satisfactory answer I can give you here, but it's my answer. Ms. Ruland, can you comment on that? Or are people in the plenary willing to comment? We have microphone runners on both sides of the room, and um, they can collect your questions and your ideas. So if you want to contribute to the discussion, you're most welcome. Uh, it's a very difficult topic anyway. Are there any people who would like the floor? There was a lot of criticism of the proposal of the German EU presidency in this respect, but um, cohesion was mentioned several times. Everyone wants that, or e almost everyone in Europe wants that, not everybody. Um, but it's difficult to get that. So how can we um, try and support that? Universities and alumni play an important role. I believe it's a process that takes much longer than we can ever imagine. And it includes a bottom-up process, but also a top-down process by politicians. I come back to universities. It looks like a jigsaw puzzle with lots of different parts, culture, art, science, education. They play central roles because it's particularly young people who go abroad to learn about different values, see different perspectives, and reflect that back in their countries. I think we have to have a lot of stamina. It's also a question of communication. I was in Brussels frequently. DAAD is a central agency for Erasmus+. Plus. We also um, coordinate other programs with the EU and with our European partners. And for that, we have to travel frequently to Brussels. But also the communication from Brussels to the countries and back could be further developed. Mr. Gergen? Well, two aspects. One aspect is it is not a natural thing to feel that you're German or French. When looking back, it took approximately 100 years before people were educated in a way that they um, all of a sudden found 
while singing the national anthems that there were enemies. That we want to make our children Europeans um, is confronted with the fact that it takes at least one um, generation. And improvements alone don't change a society. A society will not change before reality is where the normative improvements are. So we should enjoy more what we're doing. Europe does not become a success if we're all in a bad mood. But it will be a success when we enjoy what we do, who we are, and that we're different. Well, we should actually um, tell that to the people who are responsible for the medium-term financial framework. Well, are there more questions coming into the social met uh, networks um, or questions here in the room for the two speakers? There is a gentleman in the back of the room. Ms. Kleinschmidt will hand him the microphone. Well, could I comment briefly, uh, because you talked about the European uh, foreign science policy. Um, that's an interesting topic, and uh, the EU has a number of projects for that. A strategy um, is not yet in place, Mr. Gergen, if I'm not mistaken. But it's a topic a lot of people are pondering about as science diplo diplomacy is very topical at the moment in many European countries. So um, also foreign science policy is important and um, people will develop that into strategy. In November 2019, there was a strategy formulated for international cultural policy of the EU. And we looked at that again and uh, discussed with the 27 member states, the uh, Foreign Service and um, other um, representations. But it hurts the nation states if you tell them that is no longer your national culture or science you're selling out there, but the European one. In Germany, I think we did two good things. There is the um, Aachen Treaty for Germany and France, establishing German-French institutions for the future. It's a small revolution because it breaks the spell of the national um, approach. Uh, in Palermo, we will be together with the Italians. Um, that makes three partners. Um, and this policy has changed a lot in Europe, and it will continue to change a lot in Europe. And this is a good thing. And before another paper comes from Brussels, well, maybe reality improves better than the normative requirements regarding reality. That would be a good thing. You think it will all develop naturally? Well, here is your question. What I expect from the EU Council Presidency is that EU uh, perceives and accepts the extent of the climate issue by admitting that in Europe we cannot cope with the crisis without massively increasing public investment because the net public investment in Europe have been around zero for many years in Europe. And this has to change if we do not only want to talk about the climate crisis and do a little bit here and a little bit there, but really understand it and acknowledge it. And I hope that during the German presidency, a first step is taken. So with the um, Green Deal and the present status, you're not satisfied? No, I'm not satisfied. It's not going far enough. Mr. Gergen, is there anything going in this direction? Well, I cannot really um, object to your criticism that it's not going far enough. I could bore you all to death by explaining why we couldn't get 
further or couldn't go far enough, then you think this is a boring bureaucrat explaining the status quo to us. But frankly, I can tell you, I understand that this is not going far enough in your mind. So please make this criticism. And then think of uh, changing the present political approach and making it better. And then it becomes a little more difficult for you and a little easier for me. Well, we need more financial creativity. The EU has one of the strongest currencies in the world, and we have a central bank that um, manages everything. And the EU is already doing a lot of creative things, but we can go much further without losing stability in our currency. Uh, Germany plays a very important role. Budget negotiations are underway, and uh, focal areas are defined. But why is it so difficult to do a little more? Well, Germany made an enormous leap. If you look at the decisions taken in the summer, Germany overcame a position that was typical for Germany for decades. There were always the three Ms, the Mark, the Deutschmark, the Mannschaft, the team, the football team, and Mercedes. And then we noticed that Mercedes is still building great cars, but they're not the only company that does it. That was the first crisis of self-image. Then the second crisis came because the Deutschmark, the Mark, no longer existed. That was very traumatic for Germans. My grandparents still calculated in Deutschmarks until they died. And then we all made the mistake that our E Euro bills are not very beautiful. They're very abstract with very little potential for identification. And the football team started losing too. That was terrible for Germany as well. And now, together with France and the other European countries, we um, did away with a dogma in the times of COVID. And we pursue a much more progressive financial policy than we ever dreamt of. The Minister of Finance talked about the Hamilton moment. And if you look at the American history and Hamilton, um, then you know they incurred debt together. I'm not saying this to, def uh, to justify that we're still not doing enough, but I'm saying that we're doing much more than you would have imagined and dreamed six months ago. And uh, we try to do something good, and please don't tell us that the good we're doing is bad. Yes, so Germany actually um, uh, ventured into new territory. And in view of the economic crisis on EU level, um, you mentioned that uh, science and uh, research has to be strengthened, but shouldn't people also say, well, um, money could be invested elsewhere, we shouldn't demand it all for science, um, or is that not your role? Well, I think that this also touches upon what you just said. I think it is possible that there was a small paradigm change in Germany. A lot of money is being spent at the moment, and people are accusing us of that. But it is um, invested into parts of the market that go in the direction of the Green Deal. You can always call it in the politicians, but it starts with every single one of us. And I think the awareness is important. I said it before. Science plays a role in our society. Um, we also focus on some great communicators. For example, Mr. Drosten, some scientific geniuses who succeed in explaining complex situations and concepts to the general population. That's not trivial. It's very important. And the Green Deal was determined by scientists. For example, hydrogen is an important issue being discussed at the moment. I was at a conference in Sweden in the context of the EU presidency, together with the commissioner of the German government for hydrogen. And it became clear again 
If we don't succeed in clarifying fundamental scientific issues, the Green Deal is not going to be successful. And this applies to a lot of other concepts and um, initiatives. So it is right if we don't make quantum leaps in research, lots of other issues cannot be resolved either. So the money is well invested. Um, OK, you advocated for a good endowment in science. Now, we might be able to answer one more question. We don't have any in the plenary. Ms. Wedel, do you still have one? from the internet. Well, we have a lot of questions about migration, but I think you want to cover that in the next round. And we have several people who repeat how important the DAAD scholarship was, that it changed people's lives, that it was a sign of recognition, that we believed in the people who received the scholarships, and that it opened their minds about Europe. And uh, we have a lot of participants who say that Erasmus is incredibly important in order to strengthen European identity. Thank you, Ms. Wedel. I think we can leave it at that. And if I remember Mr. Gergen's words correctly, he appealed to the alumni to help shape and make progress on the European level. So I close this panel. I thank Ms. Ruland and Mr. Gergen for informing us about what's going on and for answering our questions. Thank you very much. That worked quite well with the participation of you here in this room and you outside on your screens. We will continue with that. In the course of our panel discussion, it's something new. I've never done it like this before, but let's try it out. We've subdivided the panel discussion into three different blocks. During the first one, we'll deal with the current challenges that the EU is currently facing, pandemic, migration, solidarity, the rule of law, lots of different things that we would like to discuss in the first part. In the second part, we will deal with sustainability and climate protection. We've briefly touched upon this already, and in the social media, this was mentioned as well, because this is a topic which is particularly near and dear to many. And the third block is very far reaching because it deals with the role of Europe in the world. And in each of these blocks, in the third one, we probably have to constrain our time a little bit. But each and every one of you can get actively involved in the discussion. We are not going to deliver presentations, but in each and every block, you will be given the chance to ask questions and share your ideas with us. So you're called upon to take an active stance. I have to add to that because we don't have time till tomorrow morning. So maybe I have to stop you here or there abruptly in order to move on to the next block, but please bear with me. Let me introduce the panelists to you, and I would like to take a seat now. Let me wait. welcome Kerstin Stoffler. She's a member of the CDU, a member of the German Parliament. Welcome. Please take your seat. She is a member of the Committee on European Affairs and Committee on Education, Science and Technological Impact Assessment. She also signed the Erasmus Plus letter calling for more support for that program which was sent to the Chancellor. What by what combined, what um, do you see in Europe? She traveled a lot through Europe when she was young. She had the typical interrail ticket that we all had when we were young and traveled to the most important big capitals. This is the first time when she felt Europe also due to lots of good food. And she discovered her strength and her love for Europe. On to Verena Bleching. Talcourt, she is the Vice President of this International University in Berlin, the Free University in Berlin. She lived in Japan in the US for more than 10 years, and she can look at things from an international angle. She told me that the European idea needs to be filled with life. Exactly that is happening at the Free University. How and when is what she's going to tell us in a minute. Now I'd also like to welcome Mr. Bloss, Michael Bloss. He's a DID alumni, he attended the Carlo Schmidt program and spent some time at the United Nations in New York and he got a really attractive job offered, but he didn't accept it because he wanted to go back to Europe. He was the spokesman of the Association of Young European Brothers and in 2019 
He became a member of the Green Party in the European Parliament. We're happy to have you, Mr. Bloss. The next guest I would like to welcome is connected to us via the internet in Brussels, Siegfried Moosan. He comes from Romania. Let me tell you who he was. He's working with the National Liberal Party in Romania. He was also a DAAD scholar. He went to the Free University of Berlin. He worked at the German Bundestag. Here he is. We're happy to have you. Therefore, he speaks German fluently, and he's the vice president now of the European People's Party in the European Parliament, a member of the Economic and Budgetary Committee, and he was always one of the chief negotiators of the European Parliament, and now he acts as a reporter of the European Parliament on the Green Deal. So he knows what's actually happening behind closed doors. Mr. Morosan, you can hear us. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your invitation. Brussels, now let us start off with a question to you, Mr. Morosan. The pandemic has led to the fact that you cannot come to Berlin because Brussels is one of the risky areas. It's not that easy. You might have to pass a test and go into quarantine. Does this pandemic show us that the EU also has its weaknesses because borders have to be closed and the freedoms that we all used to enjoy have to be limited? Unfortunately, I cannot be with you today because of the coronavirus. but. This has nothing to do with the European Union. Many things that we weren't able to do, meeting friends, visiting family members, going to the cinema, going to the opera, all these things weren't possible due to Corona. But this doesn't have that much to do with the European Union, to be honest. Therefore, I'd like to start off by saying that we shouldn't always blame the European Union for everything that's happening. The European Union should not be our scapegoat all the time. I think the European Union could rather help us overcome this crisis. In the health sector, as well as in the field of education, the competences of the EU are rather limited, as you will know, unlike in other areas such as agriculture, free trade, or international trade. The European Union negotiates on behalf of all the 12, 20, 27 member states and concludes international agreements. But in the field of education or health, in the course of time, the member states of the European Union have said, well, we will deal with that at the national level or even the federal states or at the regional level, although the European Union in the field of health doesn't have many competences that it can make use of. Over the last couple of months, we have managed to contribute to solving the crisis. Financial resources were made available and mobilized in order to be invested in those regions where it was necessary. We purchased medication and productive equipment, face masks, at the European level. And we distributed amongst those countries where they were needed most. People who were corona-infected, severely ill, people were treated coming from one country in another European member state. We managed to achieve all that. In the beginning, during the first weeks of the crisis, we had to get used to that because never ever had we experienced anything like that before. So therefore, there was no panacea available. Nobody really knew how to overcome such a crisis. This is why we had to sort of gather ourselves and define our own role. But I think we managed to do so successfully after the first weeks after the outbreak of the crisis. The European Union needs to become more modern. We will talk about the Green Deal about greening, but I would like to say one thing at the very beginning. The corona crisis will most definitely make us become more digital, so we will be much more interconnected. And this means we, that we can breathe life into the concept of you, even though we can't sit together in the same room due to corona, we can't be together. I can't be in Berlin due to corona. but. Maybe another event will follow this event after Corona, and maybe for time reasons, one or the other might not be able to travel to Berlin, but we can hold digital meetings. Maybe prior to Corona, this would not have been compatible. Mr. Morozan, thank you very much. We are all becoming much more digital, and I think 
This will also in the near future lead to the fact that Europe will become much more diverse and we will experience it much more intensely with the help of the digital media that we are currently using and familiarizing ourselves with. What a better example than this event tonight, Mr. Morstan. Thank you so much. You have a sister in spirit, Mr. Scherfler, who wanted to say the same that you said, and she expressed herself in a presentation delivered in front of the parliament and one of the AFD colleagues made a rather critical statement, but you said, Mr. Stofner, after some difficulties in the beginning, there, were a, there was a lot of solidarity, just as Mr. Morozano said. What gives you hope? Secret Morozano just gave us a couple of examples. Today, we talk a lot about education and research, and especially in the field of research. The big hope is, at the current moment in time, that we will be able to develop a vaccine rather quickly. How do you do that in Europe? With a common European research project or program. It is not that each and every state acts in isolation. And this alone constitutes a major challenge to all of us. But we accept it and jointly work on it, as all the member states of the European Union. And this really goes to show that cooperation in the European Union works much better than some might think. Mrs. Blechinger Talcott, you are responsible for international affairs at the Vice President of the EFU Berlin. Can you support what Mrs. Staffler has said? Yes, I'm fully on page, Mrs. Staffler. I think it's of the essence that we take action jointly. In research and in teaching, we need to cooperate as much as we can. I think a German mathematical study cannot be elaborated on its own, but we need international science and international research because you have to be able to look at things from different angles. Only in this way can we cope the challenges that we are facing jointly. Only if we act together can we be strong. And this is why it's difficult during the corona crisis, of course, because the first reactions to the virus showed us very clearly that we sort of fell back on national territories, you know, borders are closed, traveling is no longer possible, embassies were closed, no visas are issued. And that makes it rather difficult if you say at the same time that you want to go global in the field of research, that you want students to get enrolled at our national universities. We have managed to find creative solutions. Mrs. Dulant is absolutely correct in what she said. Universities will be different in the future than there were even in the month of January or February this year. But we also need a physical exchange, especially for young people. Mr. Staffler made mention of it itself just now. You also have to, have to eat the food of other countries. You have to live another life if you want to become European, live other person's life. Of course, you can share that digitally over the screen, but you need to take one step further. You need to spend some time physically in a different country and experience the different culture. That is what we need. So I'm quite positive with regards to what we have achieved. The virus cannot set any limits to us, but there are also some dangers. We might limit our spaces all too quickly. Well, too much nationalism, this is what Mr. Bloss said, giant nationalism is a term he coined. Going beyond that, aren't we going back to that, to that giant nationalism, maybe? It's always very difficult if you try to make forecasts in order to say what might happen after Corona or afterwards. What I already said, and which was an asset for the European Union, was the first reaction. But, you know, people resorted to nationalism again. One example was that medical products were not sent to Italy from Germany, although they were already paid for when Italy was really in a disastrous situation. And these wounds have to heal because, you know, People were in misery in Italy, and they called for solidarity, but Germany did not act in solidarity, and this will be remembered for quite some time. The good thing about the crisis is that you can use it for your own benefit, and maybe things that were better, that were difficult beforehand can be resolved in a more effective and efficient manner. And we, of course, tapped the potential in the European Union with our rescue packages and the way in which we spoke about Eurobonds in the past, 
Now, changed our perception because now for the first time the EU has got the possibility to incur debts. I think this is a great step forward. The experience within Europe is that we have the feeling of belonging together as an economic area. We are highly interdependent, but sometimes our policies are far too national, especially in the field of economic and fiscal policies, but we've made some headway in this regard. I think it is important that we keep it that way and maybe think along the long run what we really need in the European Union in order to be able to jointly tackle these tremendous economic crises. Thank you very much, Mr. Bloss. Back to the topic of freedom, freedom of scientists, because there are many people who are connected who have a university background. And we do have our difficulties with that in Europe. Let me just mention the Belgrade University, which was forced to move to Vienna. What was the role of the European Union in this context? And what can the European Union do in order for us to get things better under control? Mr. Morosan, in the last 10 years at the European level, in, in the, all the 27 member states of the European Union, there were three crises, the financial and economic crisis, the refugee and migrant crisis five years ago, and now the corona pandemic. During each and every crisis, we became aware of the fact that it is absolutely of the essence to comply with European rules and regulations. Economic stability is extremely significant. We need to seek new to the outside borders of the EU. Of course, it is also necessary to help the refugees, but illegal migration must not be permitted, it must be banned. Therefore, we have to secure our outer borders. During the corona pandemic, we have also seen how important it is to see to it that member states of the European Union do not incur too many debts. If they are affected by such a crisis like the corona crisis, they need to make sure that the economic system remains stable because Financial resources have to be available for the national budgets in order to show, ensure that these countries can navigate through the crisis as safely as possible. I would like to add the following. At the European level, the institutions and entities, the rules and regulations that we define for ourselves need to be complied with. Rule of law, anti-corruption, the freedom of the press, all these values are part and parcel of it. As always in life, first of all, there is a disease, then you get some medication, you get your medical treatment, and in some of the member states of the European Union in recent years, we have observed some developments that we did not consider to be possible in the European Union. There are some criteria for the accession to the European Union, democracy, anti-corruption, the rule of law, and the like and they need to be complied with and adhered to. But what happens after the accession was not subject to the very strict mechanisms up until now in all the different areas I mentioned before. Because we did not think that it would be possible for countries to step back. So therefore, at the European level, we've got to develop new tools and instruments in order to ensure that the freedom of the press, the freedom of education, anti-corruption, and the rule of law, and an independent judiciary system will be maintained and uphold. Let me just add to that. You said first there is um, the disease and then there is medicine, but the impression we have is that the medicine is not very effective, at least the one we have at the moment. Um, now, when it comes to um, the freedom of science and the enforcement of the freedom of science, so there is an infringement of the rule, but there is no real reaction yet, Mr. Bloss, is there? Well, on the European level, we sometimes have the problem that as the European Union, we can um, make some rules, but we cannot enforce them, and that is the question. Then there are constitutional um, proceedings against countries that um, violate these rules, but it's a very 
cumbersome and long-term uh, process in the Article 7 um, issue um, that countries might lose their right to vote um, is that is problematic because countries cover up for each other. Now, how can we develop that further? Mr. Musian knows the situation better than I do um, because he negotiated the budget. And the question is now, how is that European money spent? Could it be that uh, money coming from European taxpayers goes to governments where there is no constitutional control left? then this is not acceptable, I think. So the German EU presidency, at least Mrs. Merkel, uh, vehemently advocated for this in the European Parliament. But what we're seeing at the moment is not yet what we actually need. What we see is a proposal where these violations and infringements have to be related to European funds. This is not acceptable. Science, freedom of science has to be um, granted in general, and the uh, f freedoms have to be guaranteed. And if that is not the case, European money should not go into these countries. What we're seeing at the moment is a little bit reluctant and hesitant. Well, there is a proposal for compromise. Um, we should and could talk about um, uh, migration, and it's about human dignity and absolute important value in the European Union. But we're running out of time, so we should involve the plenary. Are there any questions from the plenary? Otherwise, um, the social media team, Ms. Vedel, can maybe present some questions that came in. Well, migration was one issue, but another one is human rights. Uh, I think Mr. Murishan and Mr. Bloss already commented on that. And the question was raised by Josep Puig Montada that human rights are the backbone of the EU. But don't you think that human rights are in danger in some countries in the EU? I don't know whether the panel would like to comment further on that. This is one question. Um, then. Regarding migration, there's also an expectation regarding the EU presidency by Mr. Sebastian Fiedler, who um, would like to see the promotion of um, so, so, so solutions in solidarity to combat the origins and causes of migration in the entire EU. Marek um, specified it further in his question, saying, what does responsibility for Africa mean? Does it mean that we help Africans in their countries or that we accept illegal migration to the EU? And there is a question raised by Teresa Cardete, whether the local level um, should be paid more attention to when it comes to the recognition and acceptance of refugees and their integration at the local level. Now, Ms. Staffler, would that be um, something you advocate for, that is um, looking for local solutions? Well, I am a directly um, elected member of parliament. Um, I'm directly related um, and intensively exchanging opinions with the um, local politicians I represent. And um, there is a lot of skepticism among these politicians because they rightly ask, now, if it should be possible, and it's worth thinking about it, that some individual municipalities or local authorities say we have space, we can accept refugees. It should also be possible the other way around that municipalities or local associations or local authorities says we don't have space and we don't want to accept refugees. But if we accept that, that the municipalities can decide and the local authorities can decide um, and they can also ask their citizens because they um, decide about the elections on the local level. 
if we make it possible that they decide locally, then we will have very difficult discussions. And at the end of the day, there might be the situation that we have an incredible division among our society. And this is not what I want. What I want is that we find a joint solution and agree on a joint solution. It's not only about municipalities, local authorities, federal states in Germany. Um, it applies to Europe as a whole because it's only then that we can actually tackle this challenge. Don't think about the small units, uh, about the big units, but there are peers of large German cities like Cologne and Dusseldorf who um, offered to accept refugees. And you said that there might be a division coming. It was about human rights. It was about uh, human dignity. If you look at Moria, a refugee camp that was on fire. Um, and if you see that people maybe illegally try to uh, drive refugees back into the sea towards um, Turkey, isn't that a violation of human rights, Mr. Bloss? Absolutely. And we have to be um, very careful. People mentioned illegal migration. There is no possibility to legally enter Europe as a refugee. If you want to apply for asylum, you have to do it in the country, in Greece or in Germany. But to get into that country, I have to overcome the border. And I do that illegally, and I become illegal. So things don't fit together. So it's very difficult to talk about illegal migration. These are refugees, people who want to exercise their right to asylum. And they have to be offered this possibility. I think we saw the fire in Moria. These are people who have been on this island for more than a year under conditions that are not dignified. And um, after the fire, many cities, not only in Germany, but all over Europe, declared their willingness to accept these refugees. And it is a question of humanity to uh, do this. There is an incredible need. There is incredible des despair. And we have to do something. And it is inhuman if politicians discuss this. Uh, and France hasn't accepted anyone, and nobody understands that. We become, in, uh, no, we are no longer credible in the European Union. It's a contradiction um, to our principles. If the European Union stays, we are a union of values. We want to enforce these values. But when it comes to the crux that uh, we have to enforce these values and we don't do it, it is not only detrimental to the people locally who are the victims, but also to the European Union as a whole, and it creates division. Well, I do not completely share your view, but it is indeed um, a fact that Germany is now the only country in the European Union that rightly accepted the particularly vulnerable refugees from Moria. But we could also um, say that Germany is running against the mainstream at the moment. I um, do not completely share your view, but we must see that when we talk about European unification, European Union, um, when we talk about improving and deepening our cooperation, it only works if we agree on what we want to achieve together. And it doesn't work if every country does what they consider best for them. So like in many other areas where we've rightly demanded um, from the member states of the European Union to join forces, we also need to work here together. And if every country does what they want, it will not work. We need a joint solution. Well, I haven't heard a country say, Germany, please don't accept the refugees. 
they weren't against that. Okay, Mr. Bloss thinks this is a problem of credibility. Uh, Minister of State, Mr. Roth, uh, who um, substitute for Mr. Ma said that this is a very difficult problem, difficult to solve. So we should come to the next block of our discussion. We're running out of time. And this is about sustainability and climate protection, a, a topic that has become very important. It's one of the top priorities also in the incoming questions from DAAD alumni. And there were um, specific ideas, the plastic bottle system, the European uh, train network and railroad network um, and uh, other ideas. And now we want to see another Menchi meter slide with a question. How do you assess the EU's environmental and climate policy? This is our question to the alumni and alumnae. And I hope we get a nice, colorful array of answers. We limited your answers or scope of answers somewhat. Stop talking and take action was one option. Second option. Have this topic on the agenda. That's very important. And number one, option number one, priority should be the fight against the pandemic and its consequences and climate protection should not be so much in the forefront. But the overwhelming of alumni voting and following this conference believes that it is already not high noon, but after high noon, and something should happen. Mr. Bloss, you already said that the pandemic um, led to sp spending of money from the recovery fund, and uh, it is bound to climate protection um, issues. Are you happy with that spending? Well, I'm happy that we spend money. The European Parliament wanted more money, we actually, with a great majority, said we need to spend more money. But unfortunately, what happened in the negotiations was that money that was uh, earmarked for the Just Transition Fund, money that was earmarked for the Invest EU program, um, promoting technologies in companies. Um, who work with renewable energies or to decarbonize steelworks, particularly in these climate-relevant expenditures, there was a cutting of funds. I didn't understand that. And we give most of the funds to the member states, asking them to spend it right and then report later how they spend it. But the hard conditions that it can only go in one direction don't exist. And for me, this is um, an excessively lax program that now we have this historic exception of spending so much money to um, achieve decarbonization. That's necessary. If we invest in the wrong areas, then the necessary action cannot be taken. And we in the parliament are still negotiating this. Of course, it's not possible without the parliament, although some governments would think it would be easier without the parliament. But sometimes democracy is not easy. So we in the parliament are trying to further specify that. Um, thank you very much. Um, we heard some objection from Mr. Morrison. You are the chief negotiator in the negotiations about the Green Deal. Give us some insight. What is the direction of arguments and what is the awareness there? First of all, I looked at the answers of our former scholars with a lot of interest and a lot of attention. And the clear answer is that Europe needs to do more in fighting climate change. That also became apparent in the elections of the last European, in the results of the last European election. And people in Europe simply expect from us that we do more in this regard at the European level, and we are willing to do more with the help of very specific and concrete measures. That's my first point. The second point is the fight against climate change due to the corona crisis 
and during the corona crisis should not be overlooked because climate change is nothing where we can pay lip service when no other crisis hits us in the European Union. It is an ongoing task. This is why it is of the essence that we do everything in our power to fight against climate change during the crisis and after the crisis, and this is what we're currently doing. In September, the President of the European Commission, when she gave her State of the Union presentation, she made very concrete and specific proposals. We are supposed to reduce our CO2 emissions by 55 percent in 2050 compared to 1990. Originally, our target was 30 percentage points, but this means that we've become much more ambitious and we all have to do more. As consumers and clients, we don't necessarily have to have a card, if so, an environmentally friendly. But also as decision makers, the European Union needs to make its contribution and it will certainly do so. 30% of the EU reconstruction fund and the EU budget will be allocated to fund measures to counter climate change, environmental protection, to increase energy efficiency, and to reduce CO2 emissions. 30% of our budget will be invested in those fields. So we are willing to do our contribution at the European level, but the same holds true for the nation states and the private business community. Of course, private industries need to make a major effort, and they're willing to do so. But also decision makers need to be put on to a certain level of pressure. But of course, to a limited extent only because we don't want the bubble to burst. We need to modernize the European society. We need to become greener and become more digital. We need to create new jobs within the European Union. That's possible with the help of innovation and new technology. And this brings us back to the field of education, research, and innovation. Simultaneously, we want to strengthen Europe as an economic area, we need to be able to be competitive in the future. So therefore, we, in general, have to become more modern, make more of an effort. I think we are willing to do so. Maybe not as willing as we are as consumers or decision makers. Of course, we have to wait to cooperate with the private businesses, but we always need to make sure that we keep the right balance. One thing is definitely sure, there is no way back after the corona crisis. We can't go back to the time before the corona crisis. We are all currently changing our own behavior, and it might also very well be that even after the crisis, we will meet for digital conferences and use this format because we can do much more in a digital fashion. Otherwise, it might not be possible to hold this meeting because traveling back and forth in the European Union might be too expensive and environmentally unfriendly. So we as consumers change our behavior profoundly. Of course, there will be some risks affecting some businesses and others will be provided with new opportunities. Some will have to reorient themselves and we as decision makers at the national and at the European level have to be available to render support and assistance also with financial means so that the business community can become more innovative, more digital, but also competitive. Thank you, Mr. Murashan. The climate generation that Mr. Bloss belongs to is also represented in the European Parliament, but also at the European universities. Mrs. Blechinger-Talgott, what are the universities doing in order to gain more headwind, gain more ground in the field of climate protection? Two topics. Other topics I would like to mention, of course, this is the topic which is most near and dear to our students. This is what we observe at the Free University in Berlin, as well as within our European University network, UNA Europa. This is what the students are most interested in, and they expect an answer. 
they are willing to commit themselves strongly. These are highly topical issues, state of emergency. Last year at the Free University, as a first university in Germany, we declared the climate situation in Germany as being in a state of emergency, and we want to, be, to become CO2 neutral up until 2025 at the university level. But we've been working along these lines for 20 years already. We started off in 2000 with adopting a sustainability concept at the university. Since then, we've reduced our CO2 emissions by 80% already, and energy costs by one-fourth. So it really pays off, makes the chancellor happy as well. That's one thing. But on the other hand, we are also trying to modernize and adjust our curricula accordingly in order to incorporate sustainability and, co and climate change. We've done that at the Free University already and the initial training schemes for bachelor. Now within the European University Network, we put a lot of issues on our agenda, such as the European identity, European studies, strengthening Europe, promoting sustainability, artificial intelligence, and our cultural heritage. These are the four topics that we cover in our alliance, and the eight member universities of our network have now joined jointly launched the initiative to offer a joint European Bachelor study for sustainability. I mean, this is a long way to go that we have in this regard because there are eight different accreditation systems in place for certain study courses, but we are on the right track. We are well, away in, well underway. And according to our possibilities, we develop and create the appropriate concepts, our students are willingly on board. How can we organize our campus effectively and efficiently? What can we learn from each other? Business trips. How can we reduce CO2 emissions and compensate for them by planes, by reinvesting certain amounts on campus for climate detection and measures leading towards more sustainability? It's great fun to collaborate with our European partners and learn from them where their new ideas are. are the Catholic University of Leuven is one of our partners, and it has set in place a business trip regime where it says every ton of CO2 caused by a flight costs, I think, 40 euros or something like that. And the money that can be mobilized in this particular purpose can be used for one of the five projects depending on the traveler's liking. So the traveler might say, OK, I'm traveling. I'm much more ready. I really have to catch a plane, or can I rather use a train? But when doing so, I also reinvest into our projects in order to make an active contribution. That is a very popular scheme, and we are trying to integrate this in our innovation management scheme at university. So, so a lot is happening at the university level as well, even going into the tiny bits and pieces. Yes, you spoke about climate protection, and you said that this is very important, but you're not very much in favor of bans. Do you should not try to achieve your goals by imposing bans. But strangely enough that I said that Mr. Zuda asked for a ban on combustion engines by 2035. No, he didn't speak about a ban. He said that new car registration with combustion engines will no longer be possible. So it's not a ban, and I didn't say that I'm completely about bans. But this is not really my favorite topic, to be honest, and to say the least. I'm very much in favor of thinking much more strongly about research and innovation. Because in this way, we can achieve much more than imposing bans only. We have to use innovation and drive them forward to such an extent that well, with bans in Germany or in Europe, we can only achieve that far. But with innovation, you can achieve progress the world over. And therefore, you can have a much greater impact than you can at the national or European level alone. And that is why I'm very much in favor of promoting innovation. I'm, of course, also a professional researcher, but as I said before, I'm very much in favor of investing much more into research and innovation. So I have to say quite honestly, now we are talking about Europe and the European level, so I was a bit disappointed, and I made mention of this before already, but especially for these topics such as innovation and research in the draft of the multi-annual financial framework, there was not as much in it as we had hoped for. 
My colleague from the European Parliament, Markus Faber, said that the proposal for the multi-annual financial framework is the expression of national egotism, and since now it's up to the European Union and the European Parliament to turn this into something rather European. And this is also the homework for the two gentlemen here sitting in our midst, especially based on training programs with the help of Erasmus Plus and in the field of innovation and research, much more can be achieved. So this is why I think many more financial resources would be allocated to these fields. Thank you very much. This is the homework that we've got to do in Germany, yes. We have to do the same at the German national level, no doubt about it. Okay, thank you very much. Now, back to questions. From you in the audience, climate protection, sustainability, is there anybody in the room who would like to ask a question or make a rather critical statement? There is a request for the floor over there. Now let us ask the lady to move over there with the mic. And we're looking forward to your question or your statement. Well, when you asked me to be critical, I said, okay, fair enough. We spoke about research and innovation. I'm not a student, but I'm rather a researcher. I don't think that everything is attributable to a lack of financial resources. I'm active in the field of bioeconomics covered by the Green Deal. And I think a lot of financial resources have already been allocated to these fields at the European level. Of course, much more can be done. But our problem at the European level right now is too much red tape, which overburdens it. In the past, somebody said, well, Europe should be fun. If I had the choice, and I cannot really complain about the German promotion projects that we are currently involved in, but if I had the choice between national or European promotion programs, which gives us many more opportunities to cooperate with so many colleagues at the European level, I always prefer to choose the national programs, because what we have to do with the opportunities that are made available to us in order to mobilize financial resources is no longer be acceptable. That's my point of criticism. It doesn't always have to do with financial resources or the lack of them, rather, but too much red tape. How could this be resolved? Well, topic that we also discussed in our European University Network is that we said in our network, in UNA Europa, we have something which is called the Future University Lab. What is the future of the university is going to look like and what is going to happen in the field of sciences? Therefore, we always have dialogue groups. First of all, the visionaries meet people who have nothing to do with red tape and bureaucratic affairs at all, but they're entrepreneurs, philosophers, artists, researchers, scholars, and they express their views, ideas, and hopes and write all this down. Then we submit all that to the group which is called the group of implementers, the civil servants, the bureaucrats, people coming from the administration of universities who've got to say, well, this doesn't work, why is that so? It is normally the first answer that you get when you are in contact with the administration and when you submit something new that doesn't fit into the framework. We said, well, we never did it that way, so it doesn't work. But then they have to explain why things don't work. And then the third part of lab tries to make it feasible, nevertheless. What are the possibilities that do exist in order to push these projects through? And we hope that we'll be able to find solutions in the first three years of our collaboration and find a shortcut to make life easier. And this is where everybody wanted to participate. You know, in some areas we spoke about issues concerning accreditation. In some areas it was very difficult to encourage people to participate in some project on a regular basis. But the Future Unilab is a project that everybody wanted to participate in, and that really makes me hopeful. One additional question, Mrs. Wedel. Is there anything on the chat? We received a lot of questions. Just one, please. We have time for one more question. 
very specifically, there was also um, a question about individual responsibility. A lot of people are willing to make a contribution themselves. Why isn't there a label yet for the carbon consumption of a product so consumers um, can take an informed decision? Mr. Bloss laughs. Well, I laugh because it's a good question because we're working on that. But I had to laugh because uh, my toothbrush has a label uh, CO2 free and my crisp bread is CO2 free too. But we have no methodology to actually establish the uh, carbon content because you would have to uh, in analyze the entire production chain to see where CO2 is released and how we can then arrive at the conclusion it's CO2 free. If I take a a flight and compensate it, it doesn't mean it's a CO2 free flight just because I compensate it for the CO2 emissions. So we have to have a closer look and analyze things more profoundly. In the context of a st strategy about the sustainability of products, there is an attempt to go into the direction of labeling. But it's very important because climate neutral is a fad. Everyone wants to be climate neutral, the commission, the free university, but to define what it actually means um, is something we haven't done yet, so the methodology is important. And for us as regulators, it's important that we have a meaningful mechanism in place because otherwise people call themselves climate neutral, but they're not. The Green Deal says the EU wants it by 2050. That was a nice concluding remark, Mr. Bloss. This brings us to the third block, and that's about the role of the EU in the world. There are lots of points we could talk about. Um, tonight on the agenda of the heads of state and government, the relationship with Turkey will be discussed. There is some stress in the discussion, I should say, um, in a very simplified fashion. We, we had Mr. Navalny in Berlin recently, more or less voluntarily. We still have problems with Belarus. The EU is also dealing with that. But let's focus on what most of us are worried about. If I look around, um, I see people nodding, and that's Brexit. Uh, we also prepared a Mentimeter question for that. You see it here. What is your opinion? Um, what should the future relationship between the EU and the United Kingdom look like? We have a scale. I agree. Um, I don't agree. We uh, have two answers. The integrity of the internal market is paramount and needs to be defended. About 50% um, answer that way. And um, actually, all options were chosen by the majority of people, but the winner or the winning answer is here that there should be no special right for the United Kingdom to avoid imitation from other European countries. Mr. Morrison, building a bridge will be important, not only in the world of science, but also in the economy. So how can we keep a bridge with the United Kingdom and at the same time don't jeopardize the integrity of the internal market? Well, one thing is clear. When we look at the fact the Brexit was a mistake, there are no winners, neither in Great Britain nor in the European Union. It was caused by populists, unfortunately, but rationally thinking there are no winners. Secondly, 500 million nationals in the European Union um, after before Brexit and 60 million left, then the smaller entity, the United Kingdom, is much more affected by Brexit than the other uh, European member state from the 27. Now we have to make the best of it, however. Our future relationship with the UK should be organized in a way that the costs and the negative consequences are minimized. What will be important, firstly, is that within the European Union, European rules apply and are upheld. 
also in the reality of the internal market. The um, Brexit should not be taken as a pretext that rules within the European Union no longer apply. So clear negative here. And thirdly, um, we need to show solidarity with all European partners, also with the small member state, the island of Ireland. And between Northern Ireland and Ireland, we're talking about peacekeeping in the border between these two countries. And there should be solidarity with Ireland. And a lot of citizens of smaller member states will watch very closely whether the European Union also, because of the pressure of the UK, um, is supporting its small member states. And we're doing that. And we have to keep that up. Regarding the future relationship between the UK and the European Union, well, unfortunately, we're getting a divorce. We will longer be married after Brexit. We will um, remain friends. We have a lot of geopolitical communalities. The UK remains an important ally within NATO, also with respect to values. There is not a single class in my home country, in Romania, when I talk to uh, students in high school, at least one student will ask me, uh, can I still go and study at universities in the UK? And if so, under what conditions? There isn't a single classroom where I wasn't confronted with that question. Um, you, uh, the universities in the UK are still attractive for young people from all over Europe. So in the context of education and research, Erasmus Horizon 2020, we should have as little change as possible. The future relationship with the UK will be different, but the best relationship you can have with the EU can only be had as a member state. And there must be a difference between the former relationship between the UK and the EU and the future relationship. But with respect to education and research, both sides can benefit. We in the UK, if we still have a very close relationship and exchange, so if students from the UK can come to European countries and if um, our students can go to the UK and British and European professors can continue to cooperate. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Ms. Stuffler uh, nodded in agreement with what you just said, the future EU research and education program in cooperation with Great Britain um, is desirable. What should it look like? But at the moment, um, we really don't have much of a cooperation. Yes, indeed, it's very tragic. So um, it has to be our intention, and I know from many discussions that we have this intention, that is, Germany and the entire EU should have the intention of very close cooperation in this area. It was mentioned already. There is a possibility that the UK, after leaving the EU, can stay part of the Erasmus program Horizon 2020. And for these programs, they should also make financial contributions, but should also be entitled to fully participate. There are other examples where it's already working. Norway, for example. Norway is doing exactly that. And that kind of cooperation is what I consider desirable. We talk to scientists working in the UK, no matter whether they are British or whether they are uh, from the other uh, parts of the European Union. They all agree on one thing. Not only money, but a lot of work and a lot of engagement and commitment has been invested in research in the UK. There are entire institutions that are funded with European money. This is not something we should give up overnight. I think we all benefit if in this area we also cooperate in the future. And I think we should um, um, offer that to EU citizens working and 
doing research in the UK, and we should uphold the hope that we continue to cooperate in this area also in the future. It is very um, unfortunate if I hear from the DAD that the number of applications for scholarships to come from the UK to Germany or from for going from Germany to the UK are declining because there is such great insecurity. And this is the worst that could happen. So we have to create certainty as quickly as possible. Yeah, this uncertainty is also seen in the small detail. Um, Ms. blechinger hotel Talcott, um, nobody knows exactly how Brexit is going, but it has already influenced working contracts in British universities. Um, the Europeans could say we have more money in our own coffers and the Brits will not get anything. That is a good thing. So how do the Brits react to that? Or how do you react to that? Well, it has already been said that Great Britain is an important partner for us. It's also a country where a lot of students want to go to for an exchange. So we need this cooperation. And it's not only about EU citizens that are in the UK at the moment. It's also about the British citizens that are here. They uh, do not know what will become of them in the future, whether they need a working visa or what happens to their contracts. We have a lot of colleagues also in our university that are British citizens, and there is a lot of insecurity and uncertainty among them. And the longer that takes, the worse the situation is. Use usually contracts expire on the 31st of December this year. Nobody knows what comes next. Everyone is waiting for instructions. But for the people who don't know whether they will still be employed on the 1st of January, the situation is dire. For the British partner universities, for example, Edinburgh, this is also an important issue. Now, we're trying to conclude bilateral exchange contracts so we can still send our students there, and they can send their students who learn German or who learn European languages to us. And there are very few uh, people in favor of Brexit among the academe here or in Great Britain, and they greatly suffer from it. Well, Mr. Bloss, you said it's very difficult to um, predict the future, but um, as a journalist, um, you really must be flabbergasted by how the situation developed. What about you in the European Parliament? Do you still believe that uh, during the time we still have, there will be some kind of a deal? Well, it looks difficult because the positions are becoming more rigid. Uh, but maybe we should stick with the um, Metaphor, um, Mr. Um, Moresan uh, mentioned, there is a divorce, we will separate, but we shouldn't forget the children. So we have the two governments, but the students here and in the UK, they will suffer the consequences. So this should also be the approach in European policymaking. Of course, on the one hand, we cannot uh, accept a breach of agreements. But I studied in London myself, and there is nobody among my friends who was in favor of Brexit. This is also a question about the divided country. Um, but there are lots of people in the European continent who are very have very close ties to Britain, and we should also consider to build bridges for these people so the situation can change eventually in the future. Geopolitically, in the long term, this is not a successful project that um, the UK is left alone, so we should think a little further than during the high and hot period of um, the divorce. So uh, yes, we shouldn't forget um, the children. And Ms. Wedel, what do the people in the chat say?
Well, the Brexit, of course, was a very important topic, but a lot of things have already been discussed in this context. It was just mentioned that a very strong appeal needs to be lodged vis-à-vis -vis the British government to keep cooperation in the field of education and science alive. There's a whole block on what can the EU do outside of Europe in order to exert more pressure and withstand this pressure exerted on it by China and Russia if old alliance seem to collapse, such as the one with the US. This is also a very important topic. Well, and in view of time, let me ask the panelists to answer that one rather quickly. There are so many things you can talk about, Mr. Moroshan, you heard the question. Europe in the world, pressure from Russia, difficulties with the US at the current moment in time. What's your take on that? Within the European Union, we have to act based on solidarity and in uniformity. We have to adhere to and comply with the rules and regulations that we've set for ourselves, rule of law, freedom of the press, democracy. The precious goods in the immediate neighborhood of the European Union also need to be exported to our neighboring countries, also in the south, although we cannot exert the same influence each and everywhere. But we need to focus on our neighboring countries at this day and age more than anything else. I know that the DAD is very much committed to this. The more stable these countries are, the more security prevails in these countries, the more prosperous the people are in our neighboring countries, the safer and secure can we live within our European borders in the 27 member states of the European Union. So therefore, I think we should really commit ourselves to our immediate neighbors. I think you will be able to understand that we're very well in connection with our American partners. Maybe after the election in the US, we will be able to establish once again closer ties because everything that we have achieved over the last 70 years in the European Union was based on a good and reliable transatlantic relationship. And this also guaranteed a high level of security to most of the European countries. Thank you very much, Mr. Morrison. You're full of hope. We do not know what will happen on the 4th of November. Maybe the case will end up at the Supreme Court. Mrs. Stadel, pressure from Russia. Does the EU have to do with it? What is your statement concerning the role of the EU in the world? Of course, there are a lot of challenges that we have to deal with. That have a lot to do with the values that we believe in and develop for ourselves. And of course, this is not in line with the way in which we would like things to be. I subscribe to what Siegfried Wertz has said. Of course, we have to look very carefully at what is happening in our immediate neighborhood. I'd like to add, there are some countries which are basically located in the center of the European Union, but are not part of it, such as the Western Balkans. As a European Union, we have to take on our responsibility for the region, especially young people coming from that area need to be given promising future prospects. Another important topic which is very important for the scientific community is the question of what is going to happen in the US. Because what I said with regards to Britain beforehand, namely that young people are willing to go there, is declining due to the current events due to the pending Brexit. Unfortunately, this also holds true for the US. Especially because the US are such a strong partner and also because we cooperate quite closely in the field of science and have always done. These are things that we are not in favor of. We're not really pleased with that. And we really need to work hard on that because especially amongst scientists in all other areas as well, but in particular at the scientific level, the close ties 
must not be loosened, but we want to continue to cooperate very closely based on mutual confidence and trust. And we also want to give young people the possibility to enjoy an open world. Mrs. Becher-Talcott, I already said in the very beginning, the European values and the European ideas are filled with life in Europe. Of course, the university in Berlin cannot tell us what will happen, but you can try to export your values with the help of the DID and Erasmus. What can the universities do and scientists in this regard? I think scientists play a very important role. We have to build bridges, especially when we're in contact with those countries where the going gets tough. So we need to foster a dialogue and work based on solidarity. Even if a dialogue becomes a bit more harsh amongst policymakers and if communication breaks down amongst scholars, it's easier to stay in contact. We have written a paper on that because the Free University, as a member of the International University Network, has a strategic partnerships with countries where they're going gets tough, Russia, Br Russia, Brazil, and the like. So we are represented in those countries. In some regions, we even have our liaison offices where we cooperate closely with the DAD offices in the region. Of course, it's important to keep the contact alive. You must not close the door and say, well, we are no longer willing to cooperate with you, because otherwise our world will become smaller and smaller. It's not only one country where there are difficulties, but you know, if that principle applied, we would only get on with the Netherlands and nobody else. And this doesn't help science, because science needs to be launched at an international level. So be critical, address things which are prob problematic, and act in solidarity with colleagues in those countries where the scientific freedoms are limited. We need to strengthen them. If need be, we also need to give them space in our country. And we do that. We are apart from scholars at risk. We have our own program, which is called Academics in Solidarity and the Academy in Exile. Here in Berlin, and in particular at the Free University, we have taken on a lot of scholars who are refugees and can no longer do their work in their home countries. In the very beginning, these were many of our colleagues who came from Turkey. Now, some of them have also come from India, China, Latin America. So the group becomes larger and larger and more diverse, and this shows how important this is. So scholars need to be able to go further and stay in context, but they must not shy away from explicitly addressing difficult issues. I think this is very much in line with what Angela Merkel has said. She's also a scientist by profession. Maybe there is a connection there. Mr. Bloss, who discussed a whole plethora of different topics, Belarus, he also spoke about follow-up effects in Zimbabwe in Africa. What would be your most important point tonight? Well, I really enjoy what I just heard giving scholars the possibility to work here at a German university who are refugees, great. Also a great symbol for what Europe could be, to put it that way. If you look at the international environment, you will be able to realize that everything that relates to international regimes, human rights, which are basically universally applicable, and the principle of science as a whole is kind of eroding. Nobody is annoyed any longer about the fact that Trump lies. Five years ago, this was a totally different ball game, but now this is nothing new any longer. And achievements that we made can fragment rather quickly. I think the European Union, what it could be in the world, is the place where we really take these values seriously. We do not only say them, but actions speak much louder than world words. This is also reflected in what you do at your university at a practical level. And it also means, too, that you're authentic. Let's not talk about Moria again. But, you know, in the world of science, and this was not mentioned before, but I wanted to allude to this topic very briefly, climate science. When you look at science in the field of climate, 
in detail, you will see that we are in a quite unique situation which is rather critical because our possibilities are limited. The CO2 emissions are limited that we can use up before we reach the 1.5 or 2 percent uh, to degree goal. So the EU is embarking on the right track, but listen to science is a principle that still needs to be filled with life. We still have a long way to go. It might have positive aggravating effects. The difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees is the difference between 120 million people who will not l lose their homes. So the question is what happens to people who are losing their homes will simply not crop up. So if we work on this consistently, then we might be able to be able to be kind of a police force for other countries the world over. You know, some people in some countries might think, well, there's the European model, the Chinese model. Maybe, hopefully, there will not be a third different uh, American model. But is will we our strengths if we convey this message in an authentic way and if actions speak louder than words with a view to our values, what you could be. So you get some applause. Thank you very much for this interesting discussion. We used as much time up as possible, but I really enjoyed it. It was so much fun to me. Thanks for your very much, Mr. Borosan, to Brussels. Here is your applause. And thanks to the panelists up here in Berlin. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to thank the members of the team that helped organize this meeting in Brussels, Bonn, and Berlin. Thanks very much to the team of the DAID presented by Mrs. Weber, who forwarded the questions from the social media team to us. Thank you very much. Well, let us give her a big hand as well. Now, I would like to say goodbye to you. Goodbye to you back home. Thank you very much for your active participation in the discussion. I participated or hosted this hybrid event for the first time. I think we did very well. It was fun. And now let me once again pass the floor to our host, Mrs. Ruland. Well, I would just like to say thank you, too, because it was an exciting meeting and conference. A long time ago, we had planned to get together for an entire weekend with the alumni and alumni to discuss all these topics. Unfortunately, we're living in times where this is not possible. But as a hybrid event and as an input event, this was very interesting and very motivating. Mr. Gergen is no longer here, but I would like to say it's been fun. We enjoyed it. But we didn't give up our plans. We just postponed them. We have to be pragmatic and see whether we can do it next year, if not the year after next. Until then, you can um, meet in uh, national and transnational EU IDEA labs. Ms. Wiedel is your contact for more information. Summarizing everything that has been said would be a little bit ambitious, but I would like to say two things. Subcutaneously, I had this impression that we're living in very special times, and these affect us, and they have an impact on us. We change because of this situation, and my impression has been um, here and um, around me elsewhere that people continuously ask themselves what is important for them. And that is why sustainability has played such an important and prominent role here. And politicians also notice what's going on in the world. You can always do more. Um, it's about is a glass half full or half empty. Let's take the positive view. A lot of money is invested in sustainability in the EU has very laudable objectives, also with 2035, but we all have to start with ourselves. Uh, the politicians and uh, politics cannot resolve all our problems if we don't commit ourselves. Why do we organize meetings like this? I would like to briefly comment on that. It's important 
to us to promote exchange among alumni because they all contribute their different perspectives. And this is very good for the development of Europe. It is a process that takes a long time. Mr. Gergen is right. But this exchange of perspectives is the right and important approach so Europe can grow together. And I would like to uh, quote um, Ms. Uh, breaking a tal called um, dialogue and solidarity are important. And if we take that to heart, we can be successful. Those who are present here are most warmly invited to uh, a small reception. And I would like to thank everybody else listening to us in Europe. We would like to thank you to all of you. Um, Mr. Muta made it very clear that this is a format that involves many more people than you can usually um, have at a meeting, uh, two or three hundred. Um, and this is a great opportunity. And we should really uh, all remember, we shouldn't return to what we had before, but we should consider this an important learning curve. Um, for example, the involvement and participation of Mr. Morrison um, worked very well. I should like to thank you all very much. Um, you organized this very well. I've been in a brilliant for some time. Uh, being a moderator for a hybrid meeting is very difficult because there is another additional dimension. And you completely integrated everyone. It was great. I should like to thank all the speakers, Ms. Staffler, Mr. Bloss. Maybe Mr. Morrison is no longer listening, but his perspective was also very very interesting. Ms. Blechinger Talcott, we can't work without science, particularly in connection with sustainability. Nothing is possible without science. So let's all plan to spend money there and to commit there. So I should like to thank you all very much again. And I hope over a glass of wine or beer, we can continue our discussion in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon in another meeting. Thank you.